It's a bloody rebellion. Thousands butchered, countrysides torched. It's hell on earth. The rebels, an ethnically mixed tribal people known as Gauls. Their champion is the first general to unite the tribes, Vercingetorix. His nemesis is one of the most famous and ruthless generals in ancient history, Julius Caesar. For a hundred years, the Romans have brutally oppressed the Gauls. Now, it's payback time. The stage is set for one of the greatest military confrontations in history. A battle of technological wonder that tests the cunning and resourcefulness of the two generals. Shapes the face of Europe for centuries to come. And guarantees the future of an empire. For six years, Julius Caesar has been conducting a brutal campaign. His goal is to conquer the land called Gaul and turn it into a Roman province. By the time Caesar is given command in Gaul in 58 BC, the Roman Republic had already expanded into North Africa, Greece, Sicily, Corsica, Sidonia, and Spain. But Rome could never entirely subdue its neighbor to the north, Gaul. It had always been a little tentative about northward expansion because the Gauls and the Romans had a long history, 300-year history, of mutual slaughter and antagonism. I mean, these people in the north, when they went on in invasions, were uh, um, you know, pretty, pretty brutal people. I and mean, they, they sacked Rome in the third century uh, BC as well. So there's a lot of bad blood. But the Roman Republic grows stronger every day. Now, leading more than 50,000 Roman soldiers, Julius Caesar fights his way across Gaul with stunning cruelty. Caesar was sent to Gaul by the Roman Senate as a proconsul, that is to say, to conquer the, the area and turn it into a province of Rome. Uh, the interesting thing about this great general is he had never been in the military and had absolutely no experience in combat uh, or, or command at all. Uh, so why then do we regard him as a great general? It's a fair question to ask. And the answer is he was the first Roman general to leave not only his memoirs, but a detailed account of all his campaigns, which of course point to his brilliance and, and nothing else. Caesar writes enough about the six-year Gallic War to fill seven books. While he regards himself as a military genius, his successes may be explained by the quality of his army. By the time of the Gaul campaigns in Gaul, the Roman army was almost thoroughly professionalized. Uh, but prior to 100 BC, uh, it had always been a militia army, so you had to raise new troops every year, train them, and then put them in control of political generals, and, they, and that created problems. But military reforms, instituted 50 years before Caesar comes to power, creates a disciplined army of professional soldiers. You might have had a, quote, amateur in charge of this thing, but they were 10 legions of professional soldiers. That's, that's one point uh, which accounts for Caesar's success. The other point, I think, is that you can always be a great general if you're not fighting against anyone. And in the case of, of the armies of Gaul, uh, they really weren't significant armies. Gaul is not a unified nation with a national army. It's a conglomeration of individual tribal armies who lack discipline and cohesion. The fundamental problem with Gaul is that it was essentially an area of 15 to 20 million people. Lots of different ethnic groups, they fought with one another for generations, and they never developed a sophisticated military capability. Still, conquering Gaul is more difficult than Caesar anticipates. You couldn't just defeat one army, win a battle, 
and Gaul was yours. You had to defeat hundreds of little armies. Caesar faces each new Gallic army with growing ruthlessness. Caesar carried out some horrendous slaughters uh, as a you know, typical Roman brutality of, of making the case that, uh, you know, it's either Roman friendship or, or Roman terror. Caesar's really was a reign of terror. He destroyed entire villages, killed everyone in them, and then he went on to the next one. Absolutely brutal. And inevitably, over a period of six years, what happened was basically Roman control in Gaul was pretty much established. But underneath it all was a simmering spirit of, of hatred for the Romans and spirit of revolt, just looking for a leader uh, to spark it. Enter Vercingetorix, a charismatic Gallic general. Like Caesar, he's also on a mission to finally unite the hundreds of tribes of his homeland against Caesar. Vercingetorix is a worthy adversary to Caesar. As a younger man, he trained with and fought alongside the Roman legion. Vercingetorix was actually a cavalryman in Caesar's army early in the Gallic Wars. So he knows how the Roman army worked. He knows its strength. He knows its weaknesses. He is the right guy at the right time to take on Caesar. Vercingetorix uh, took it into his head that perhaps this was the right time, that the Gauls had probably finally had it, not this tribe or that tribe, but everyone, and that if he could provoke a spark uh, with an attack on the Romans that was successful, what might happen is for the first time, uh, all of the main tribes of Gaul would assemble together and, and resist Roman rule, defeat Caesar, and drive the Romans out. And that's what he had in mind. His plan to provoke Caesar succeeds. Vercingetorix marches more than 70,000 soldiers into the Roman town of Orleans and gives Caesar a taste of his own medicine. And he fell upon it like a lion upon a rabbit. Uh, and burnt the town and massacred and murdered everybody. The Gauls slaughter more than 5,000 men, women, and children. Vercingetorix delivers a clear message to Caesar. The Gauls will no longer stand for the Roman general's brutality. This was the spark of revolt. There was some signal event that would galvanize all of Gaul against the Rome, and that's what he tried to do. He was a fairly good strategic thinker, and it worked. There is no turning back for Vercingetorix now. The revolution has begun, and he and Caesar are on a collision course. But Vercingetorix has the momentum. You know he's scoring more victories. He has a massive army behind him, and he's using it well. Suddenly, this guy is unstoppable. Despite outnumbering the Romans, Vercingetorix knows that his large but fairly disorganized force will lose a direct, all-out battle against Caesar's highly trained professional army. So his strategy is to strike at Caesar's forces in small bursts of guerrilla-style combat until he inflicts so much damage, the Romans are forced to retreat to Italy. Vercingetorix has a policy just to keep harassing the Romans, keeping them away from food, generally giving Caesar a headache. To further keep the Roman troops off balance, Vercingetorix does something that will reverberate through all of military history. He convinces the Gauls to torch their own towns, crops, and countryside. It's a strategy now known as scorched earth. Burn everything. Burn the towns, burn the hamlets, burn the fields, everything. In other words, leave nothing upon which the Roman army can, can survive. In August of 52 BC, after implementing his scorched earth policy, 
Vercingetorix leads a small Gallic ambush force against the Romans near modern-day Dijon. The Gauls' favorite weapon is the broadsword. Made of iron, these heavy blades are designed to smash down with brute force. The Roman soldier wields a gladius, 26 inches long, two and a half inches wide. The gladius is made of razor-sharp steel and is used as a stabbing weapon. After fighting for several hours at Dijon, Vercingetorix, in true hit-and-run style, retreats and pulls his force back. The Gauls' strategy appears to be successful. From Dijon, Caesar begins moving toward the Italian border. Vercingetorix chases with his army, trying to prevent Caesar from reaching Rome and replenishing his forces. He moves his army down to block Caesar's goal going to Italy, okay? He really arrives too late. Caesar is already south of where he comes. So he's behind Caesar. He's not in front of him. And he tries to go into the attack. The Romans turn around. There's a skirmish there. There's a skirmish there, and the Romans break it off. And at that point, uh, what Vercingetorix does is he says, you know, it's getting tough to feed the army out here. I'm going to withdraw back into my main supply base, all right? And uh, hopefully, you know, Caesar, we're, all, we're done for the season. Caesar will go south and we'll, f we'll finish this next year. This proves to be a colossal mistake. Calculating that Caesar will retreat to Rome, Vercingetorix begins to march his army back to its base at Alesia, a fortified hilltop city. But Caesar isn't going home. He's going after Vercingetorix. And what Caesar does is instead of running for Italy, he whirls around on him kills its re rear guard and begins to chase him back to Alessia. As Caesar attacks the Gallic rear guard, Vercingetorix and the rest of the Gauls escape to their small walled city of Alesia. Within days, all of Caesar's 50,000 reinforcements surround the city. I mean, they just kept coming and coming. A total of 10 Roman legions suddenly surrounded Vercingetorix. He must have said to himself, what the hell have I gotten myself into here? Vercingetorix had great success leading his guerrilla war against Caesar, but now he's trapped. And the small advantage the Gauls held has completely evaporated. This is Caesar's kind of battle, and he's about to conduct one of the most fantastic siege operations the ancient world has ever seen. In 52 BC, the city of Alesia, the Roman military commander Julius Caesar and more than 50,000 Roman soldiers have trapped 70,000 Gauls and their revolutionary leader Vercingetorix inside the city. Alessia is so important because it's a big final cataclysm. It's the last shot militarily at stopping the Roman control of all of Gaul. Alesia is the modern-day city of Elise saint reine located in what is now France. The city is about five miles in circumference, likely surrounded by a small wall about six feet high. Home to about 10,000 men, women, and children, Alesia sits on a small hill some 1,500 feet above a valley. Through the valley run two small rivers. A ring of hills surround the city. It's well protected, giving the Gauls a strong defensive position. Nonetheless, Caesar decides to lay siege to Alesia, a military campaign unlike any other in history. The siege works created by, by uh, Caesar are just ingenious. And I can't find anyone or any source to say that the, his siege techniques that he used there had been used before. Caesar's army possesses the most sophisticated siege technology of the age. They are equipped with a catapult called an onager, known as the wild ass for its kick. It's capable of launching a 100-pound projectile 400 yards. The Romans also used the ballista. Latin for stone thrower, the ballista fires lead shot nearly 100 yards. Each Roman legion is equipped with 30 of these. 
But siege means more than just attacking with powerful high-tech weapons. And Caesar knows that the right tactical move at Elysia isn't an all-out barrage. Instead, Caesar believes that to win this battle, he shouldn't try to drive the Gauls out. He should starve them in. Caesar decides to build a 10-mile-long wall around Elysia to imprison the Gauls within their own city. What Vercingetorix thought would be a safe haven turns out to be a death trap. First, Caesar's soldiers dig a trench 20 feet deep and 20 feet wide. Next, they dig another trench 15 feet wide, 8 feet deep, that can be flooded with water. Then, another dry pit. And finally, work begins on a wall 12 feet high, complete with watchtowers every 80 yards. They call it circumvallation. You put up a wall around the city. It's essentially putting tens of thousands of people in prison. The purpose of that was, of course, to make sure that no one in the city could break out. They could get outside their own walls, but only to be trapped between, in a killing ground between the Roman wooden wall and their wall. That's the first thing. This is not the first time Caesar has shown himself to be a master of technology. Three years earlier, in 55 BC, 400,000 Germans were looking for a new homeland and crossed the Rhine River to settle in Gaul. Caesar immediately delivered a brutal message. He sent 50,000 of his troops to the Rhine River with orders to slaughter the Germans. What he does next was both horrific and technologically astounding. Caesar foreshadowed his engineering prowess they will eventually show at Alessia. He built a 400-foot-long, 40-foot-wide suspension bridge over the Rhine River so that he could chase them back to Germany and hunt them down. Once across the river, Caesar brutally and mercilessly ravaged the countryside. 430,000 people, men, women, children, no survivors in a deliberately calculated act of political butchery designed to send a clear message to another people. Brutality aside, Caesar's spanning of the Rhine stands as a remarkable engineering achievement of the ancient world. He built the entire bridge in 10 days. It was incredible. I mean, he built it with posts and beams and cabling. And the reason he built it was to say to the Germans, look, the Rhine isn't a barrier. We could come and get you any time we want. After the butchery, Caesar headed back to Gaul and immediately destroyed the bridge. At Alesia, Caesar uses the same Roman technological superiority to trap the Gauls inside the city. The Gallic general Vercingetorix watches as Caesar's wall rises up around him. The 12-foot-high wall is built partially from the earth dug out of the trenches. The walls are topped with wooden ramparts, and wooden towers rise every 80 yards. On top of all that, they put sharpened sticks, kind of like an early version of barbed wire, just in case someone tries to scale the thing. And except for a couple of areas, like places with natural barriers, this wall goes completely around the city. It's a race against time. Once Caesar completes the wall, nearly 10 miles in circumference, it will be impenetrable, trapping the entire population of the city of Elysia. Some 10,000 men, women, and children, as well as the new tenants, the 70,000 strong Gallic fighting force. Vercingetorix does have some beef and corn stored up at Alessia, but it's not gonna last forever. Caesar's men could go and try to steal some or buy some supplies, but that's easier said than done. Don't forget, Vercingetorix had burnt a lot of it during the Scorched Earth campaign. Vercingetorix knows that the winner of this battle will be the one who is able to stave off starvation. So he decides his only hope is to try to stop construction of the wall and stop the Romans from gathering food. If he can outlast Caesar in the city, Okay, sooner or later the Roman army would find it very hard to gather supplies and it too would wither on the vine. What he had to do is he had to keep attacking the Roman army to prevent it from foraging from supplies. 
So Vercingetorix resorts to his old tactics, hit and run. He sends several thousand of his cavalry to harass Caesar's construction workers and foragers. Vercingetorix gets away with this a few times, but finally, during one of these attacks, Caesar launches a counterattack. We're not exactly sure how many cavalry Caesar had, but I would imagine about five or 6,000 Roman cavalry and three to 4,000 mercenary cavalry. A skirmish breaks out between Caesar's wall and Alesia. The Roman cavalry gain the advantage and the Gauls retreat. But Vercingetorix orders Alesia's gates closed to protect the Gauls already inside. Very, very heavy Gallic losses. Guys off their horses, trying to basically claw their way back into the city. Vercingetorix has sentenced his men to death. Fifty-two BC, the siege of Alesia sees its first bloodshed. A cavalry skirmish has a deadly end for the Gauls. Despite winning this little skirmish, Caesar decides to up the ante in terms of the siege works. He orders more trenches to be dug, anti-personnel devices to be installed, and death traps to be built. Booby traps with huge, sharpened wooden spikes called chippy are planted at the bottom of the trenches. Iron barbs called stimuli are spread out in front of the walls to puncture soldiers' feet and horse hooves. A flood of moats were around, were, were there. Uh, trees knocked down to, to, to create obstacles. And covering it all would be whatever field guns they had uh, and, and uh, arrows, archer fire, sling of fire, uh, missiles. They could, you know, they could literally sheath fire into an uh, impact zone. After only five weeks, the 10-mile wall equipped with pitfalls, obstacles, and anti-personnel devices is nearly complete. The Gallic general, Vercingetorix, is forced to take a bold gamble. He sends his entire 15,000-strong cavalry force to ride across Gaul and recruit help from other Gallic tribes. Well, this seems to be a smart move. Think about this for a minute. He had, had pretty good success just snipping at Caesar, harassing him, not letting him get anywhere, not allowing him to gather food. But he's giving all of that up, and he says, no pun intended, send in the cavalry. Vercingetorix changes his tactical design and allows the Romans, in essence, to build the siege works and feed their own. The decision to go for help rather than continuing to try to disrupt the foragers and construction workers is a critical military decision. If the cavalry is caught and the other tribes don't respond, Vercingetorix and his army are doomed. Now, without his cavalry to send forth to harass the Roman army, they can build the siege works at their leisure, which they do. More important than that is they now can forage freely. And what Caesar understands is clearly, what does he say? He orders his commissariat to make sure you collect a 30-day supply of grain. Still, Caesar knows that if the Gallic cavalry does come back with reinforcements, it can spell defeat for the Romans. To defend against this, Caesar decides to build another wall, about 400 yards away from the first. Caesar's first wall keeps Vercingetorix in, his second wall will keep the reinforcement armies out, but it will also contain 50,000 Roman soldiers who must camp in between the two walls. Outside this wall of circumvallation, you construct a second wall called contravallation, Latin contra, against. And this wall ran 20 miles. So you have a wall inside a wall and a city in the middle, kind of like a, looking at from the top down, kind of looking at a layer cake. Now, with no cavalry to harass them, the Romans have no difficulty building the second wall. The wall is seamless, except for a small section at the base of Mount Rhea, near where two small rivers run through the valley. With the wall construction coming to an end, everyone starts realizing that the thing that's going to win or lose this thing is food. Caesar knows that once the rest of the Gauls show up, he won't be able to send his guys foraging anymore. Meanwhile, inside the city, Vercingetorix personally takes control of the beef and corn rations. Around seven weeks into the siege, supplies inside the city are low, 
they are subsisting on whatever food had been stored before the siege. Water for close to 100,000 women, children, and Gallic soldiers likely comes from the small rivers or wells. There's a story about one of Vercingetorix's tribesmen saying to him, let's just eat the dead soldiers and the citizens of the town. We could live a long time like that. This wouldn't have been the first example of cannibalism, and it won't be the last. Think of the Donner Party in our own history. You know, the old history books always call the Gauls barbarians, but they obviously had some humanity. Vercingetorix didn't allow this. Vercingetorix knows there are too many hungry mouths to feed. He devises a plan that he hopes will save the lives of some of the women and children. What he did is he sent, sent them off uh, to, the, to the Roman wall, uh, essentially saying, look, let these people go, there's no point to this, or actually take them in as slaves. Caesar rejects the offer. His own men are on the brink of starvation because the land around Elysia has been left barren by Vercingetorix's scorched earth strategy. He has little sympathy for the desperate Gallic women and children who must return to Elysia. But Vercingetorix doesn't want them back either. Having gotten rid of this large number of people that he no longer had to feed, that Vercingetorix himself refused to allow them back in the city walls so that the women and children, large numbers of women and children, were trapped between the outer city wall and the inner Roman wall where they were allowed simply to die of starvation. Some 3,000 women and children are trapped inside the no man's land pawns in the struggle of wills between Vercingetorix and Caesar. All these pathetic souls just languishing in this kind of limbo. They're literally caught in the middle of this fight. No one wants them. But in this horrible test of wills, Vercingetorix weakens first. Finally, the gates to Elysia open, and the townspeople re-enter. Caesar wins the Battle of Wills. Now the Gallic leader, Vercingetorix, doesn't get to transform his headache into Caesar's. And Caesar gets to remind people of just what kind of man they're dealing with. The outlook for the Gauls is bleak. But then, three days later, on the horizon, a Gallic relief army, some 60,000 strong, appears. They are led by Commodus, an old acquaintance of Caesar's. Commodus had been an ally to Caesar early on in the Gallic Wars. Vercingetorix had actually fought for Caesar also. So it was a real betrayal for Caesar to have these guys coming against him. Commodus wastes no time letting Caesar know he has arrived. For the first time at the Siege of Elysia, Caesar looks like he might be in trouble. 60,000 Gallic soldiers, led by a man named Commodus, have come to the rescue. They're here to help Vercingetorix, who is trapped inside the city with tens of thousands of civilians and soldiers. Commodus immediately goes on the offensive. leads his infantry and attacks the Roman soldiers stationed on the outside. The Gauls were amazingly organized for a bunch of tribes that hadn't fought together until recently. They had infantry mixed in with the cavalry and covered the whole thing with archers and slingers. Caesar has no choice but to launch 5,000 cavalry to defend the wall, but they ride into a hail of arrows. Just when it seems the Roman defenses will collapse, Caesar sends in reinforcements. His timing is perfect, and the fresh troops push the Gauls back. Despite the incredible difference in numbers, Caesar pushes the Gauls back all the way to the hills, just massacring the archers who had been supporting the Gallic cavalry. The fight rages from noon until sunset. The Romans emerge victorious. The Gauls' first assault ends in disgrace. 
The battle was nearly theirs. They had four times the number of soldiers and still could not defeat Caesar. This does not bode well. But Vercingetorix is not about to give up the fight. Somehow, he manages to coordinate with Commodus to launch a nighttime multi-pronged attack against the Roman positions. We don't know a lot about how much Commodus and Vercingetorix could communicate with each other. Maybe they had spies who could sneak through, but in battle, I doubt they could communicate at all. It's just chaos. Vercingetorix leads a force attempting to break through the inside wall. Commodus and his men attempt to scale the outside wall. A third Gallic force, also on the outside, tries to break through the outer wall on the far side of the city. Gauls are learning, trying different tactics. This time they've got the cover of darkness on their side, and they've got ladders and wall hooks to scale the walls. Unfortunately for the Gauls, Caesar still has the upper hand. Up in the siege tower, he can easily see exactly what the Gauls are doing. With the high ground, Caesar's men easily repel the Gauls below. They were launching arrows, but also just this huge supply of stones and sharp sticks. Nothing sophisticated, but I wouldn't want someone standing 12 feet over me throwing stones at my head. You're trying to fill in these ditches and moats, and the whole time, people are throwing deadly debris at you. In between the walls, Vercingetorix is getting pummeled. On the other side of the city, Caesar's siege works are doing their job. The little presents that Caesar planted, the anti-personnel devices, are really paying off here. These guys can't take a step without falling 10 feet onto a huge spike or getting a hook caught in their legs. Caesar's brilliantly planned siege of the city is proving too much for the Gauls. Comanus is being beaten on the outside, Vercingetorix is being beaten on the inside. The anti-personnel devices are killing Gauls right and left. And they both have this constant rain of Roman throwing spears and arrows coming down on them. By daybreak, all the Gallic forces, both inside and outside the walls, are forced to retreat. Once again, Caesar is successful. It's got to be driving Comanus and Vercingetorix crazy. They have three times the army, yet they're spending most of their time filling up ditches and dying at the hands of the Romans. Caesar's like a master chess player. By imprisoning Alessia, then building the second wall to repel the Gauls from the outside, he's neutralized the numbers advantage the Gauls have. Absolute genius. Five more days pass. Starvation is taking its toll on the Gauls. Desperately, the Gauls try to figure out how to stop the Romans. They were already beaten back twice, but they had to do something. The people inside were beyond being out of food. Finally, the Gauls discover the weak spot in the Roman outer wall near the foot of Mount Rhea. Because of the Ose River, Caesar couldn't completely connect his outer wall. It's a gap Commodus hopes to exploit. So what they do is they sneak under cover of night to that weak spot tucked between the two hills, and they stay hidden in the woods. At noon the next day, they attack. Commodus's men flood through the opening in the wall and ravage the Roman infantry. At another part of the wall, a second Gallic force attempts to break in. The second Gallic force begins to overwhelm the wall. The Romans are simply running out of stuff to throw at them. At the same time, Vercingetorix attacks from the inside. Caesar watches this three-pronged Gallic attack from his siege tower. Historians like to debate whether Caesar was really such a great tactician. You know, but what he did at that final battle, it was like conducting an orchestra. Caesar decides to commit 3,600 reinforcements to his defenses at the gap in the wall. 
he ordered reinforcement cavalry to come around from the northeast side to help protect the weak spot. But at the same time, the Gauls sent another 20,000 troops into the gap in the wall. But you see, 20,000 men isn't going to do you a lot of good when you're trying to funnel them through essentially a narrow gap between two rivers while you're being opposed on both sides by legion camps and in the front by a ditch and a wall. Caesar watches as the Gauls switch tactics. If they can't go through the wall, they will tear it down. By now, they're at the wall. And they're just tearing at these with these mural hooks. They're iron hooks designed for tearing down the walls of a besieged town. Everything's kind of backwards because of Caesar's walls. Usually it's the conquering force that's using mural hooks, not the defenders. The battle rages on all fronts. Caesar finally takes matters into his own hands. He personally leads 2,400 more men into battle. He takes command of four cohorts of infantry himself, puts on his famous red cloak. Uh, he always thought it important that troops should see their commander in battle, uh, and leads these four cohorts right into the fray. The Roman line was ready to break until Caesar arrived at the last minute with the reinforcements. And there he is, hacking at Gauls with his gladius, absolutely butchering them. There's a big difference between a commander saying, charge, and one saying, follow me, boys. Patton wore a red cloak just because of Caesar. Now that Caesar's there, the Roman legions put down all these pilum and javelins and things that they were throwing from a distance, and they pick up their swords, and they just charge the Gauls. Caesar has the momentum, and he's going in for the kill. More than two months into the siege of Elysia, Julius Caesar, wearing his famous red cloak, leads his men into battle against the Gauls. The texts say that what was happening is that the Roman line was ready to break until Caesar arrived at the last minute with these four, four, uh, four cohorts with the reinforcements. Uh, and at the same time, you know, increasing Roman morale because they saw their commander fighting with them with, with, the, with the red cloak. By evening, Caesar has the momentum. He chases the Gauls to their camp and cuts them down like animals. Despite the impending defeat, Vercingetorix fights on. His strategy of uniting the Gallic tribes to fight against Roman oppression has failed. Vercingetorix soon realizes he has lost. The defeat sends the message of kind of despair to the other tribes in the coalition. And after a day or two, one by one, as they had done so many times in the past, they began to wander back to their own tribal lands. Uh, and even Vercingetorix understands that the game is over. And he's the one who takes the initiative and opens negotiations with the Romans. Caesar had made a name for himself by wiping out entire tribes. 
But uncharacteristically, after this battle, he decides to spare the Gallic warriors. Caesar was pretty lenient. Way out of character for the guy who is famous for annihilating whole tribes. Maybe he sensed that in order to keep insurgents down, he had to change tactics. Maybe he even acquired a newfound respect for the way they had performed in battle. But of course, Vercingetorix had started this. He had to be made an example of. October 2nd, 52 BC. After almost two months of bloodshed, Vercingetorix finally surrenders. Vercingetorix puts his best armor on and marches through the gate, comes right up to Caesar, and tens of thousands of Romans behind him. You can imagine the scene. Here's this guy who had dared to challenge Caesar, coming face to face with him. Valiant warrior, but one who has committed a basic tactical error. He had a plan not to take Caesar head on, but the skirmish, cut his communication, cut his supply lines, just harass him at every turn. He held on to that at times when he could have tried to go in for the kill, but he stayed disciplined. Then he suddenly scrapped the whole idea. He sends his best fighters to go get help, help that didn't end up doing much good. It's fascinating. He had hung to the original strategy right to the point where it was succeeding, and then, for whatever reason, changes the strategy, and it cost him dearly. While many of the Gauls are freed, Vercingetorix is brought to Rome and executed. And as the story goes, for which there's probably not much evidence, that, when, uh, that uh, during one of Caesar's triumphs, he was, he was strangled. Uh, in, pu in full public view. More likely, he was simply executed in a Roman dungeon. Uh, the Romans were not, I mean, they, they had no, no problems with public execution. But in this case, they were just well to be rid of uh, what was called the firebrand of the Gauls, the man who was afraid that would light Gaul on fire. Caesar spends the winter extinguishing the dying embers of the rebellion. Rome will not have to fight the Gauls for another 400 years. One can compare Caesar to William Tecumseh Sherman of the March Through Georgia fame. In 1867, he was given the job of breaking the resistance of the Indians in the West. He used the exact same tactics, scorched earth, massacre, removal, starvation, against the Amerindian tribes that Caesar had against the Gallic tribes, and with the same results. He won. The Amerindians were settled on reservations, and became American. Alesia was a great personal victory for Julius Caesar, who at times was the besieged as well as the besieger. But the outcome of this battle is more than just dramatic material for Caesar's own writings. The Battle of Alesia in the long run was a one of the most beneficial things that happened to all of Europe, because what it did is it allowed the thorough Romanization of an enormous area from the Rhine all the way to the Pyrenees, what today we would call Western Europe, was, was civilized and organized as a province of Rome and then became, under the empire, essentially Rome, uh, Italy and Rome itself. It got to a point where the Gauls never thought of themselves as anything except Romans. Some say that Caesar's campaign was really a reign of terror, but at Alesia, he used brilliant tactics to defeat a large Gallic army that attacked from two directions. The result was that Caesar not only destroyed the Gauls, he united the land that would become a significant part of Western Europe. And it all was made possible, ultimately, by the brilliance of a Julius Caesar and the defeat of Vercingetorix at the Battle and Siege of Alessia.
On the brink of war, two men prepare to duel. One is Goliath, known in the Bible as a giant more than nine feet tall. The other, a young Israelite shepherd, David. It's one of the Bible's most famous stories. Behind the heroic legend lies a tale of relentless ambition, violent murder, conquests on the battlefield, and in the bedroom. David's quest will ultimately unite a people, but not before it tears a country apart. The legendary David and Goliath duel takes place around 1015 BC, a time when the Israelites are in the middle of a bloody war against a vicious enemy, the Philistines. It's been more than 200 years since the great military commander Moses first led the 12 Israelite tribes out of Egypt during the Exodus. Joshua then continued the Israelite military campaign and successfully invaded the promised land of Canaan. Now, after two centuries and thousands of lives lost in bloody battles, the Israelites no longer call this land Canaan. It is their homeland, Israel. They have become one of the most powerful military forces in the region and are united for the first time under a king named Saul. For years, Saul's war against the Philistines has been drenching the soil with blood. On a fateful day in the Valley of Allah, only one will die. But it will be a monumental and historic death. The armies faced one another for several days until, as often happened in the ancient world, uh, which believed that it was God that, des that uh, decided ba uh, battles, that uh, each side would choose a champion. And the champions would meet, and whoever won would convey victory to their side. Everyone knows the story of David and Goliath, where David ventures onto the plain, fires a sling at Goliath, strikes him between the eyes, and Goliath is killed. And then David goes over, takes his sword, and chops off Goliath's head. David's slaying of Goliath is a turning point in the war against the Philistines. But more importantly, it launches the young shepherd boy down a bloody path of intrigue deception, and paranoia, which will ultimately propel him to the throne. It's one of the more interesting aspects of the Bible, that David is held in such high regard uh, as, as the father of Israel and the king of Israel. But when you really look at his career, uh, what he really is is a kind of bloodthirsty opportunist. More than a mythical figure, more than a, a person of great valor, he more resembles the Mafia Don a very narrow, self-interested man who clearly knew what he wanted and was prepared to do anything uh, to get it, to include the betrayal of, and killing of his own people. The important thing about the incident of David and Goliath is not military, it's political and social. What happens because of the slaying of Goliath is this young man comes to the attention of the great warrior King Saul. David is an instant hero. He wins a position as King Saul's personal weapons bearer.
This gives David the opportunity to hone his skills as a soldier. But Saul's initial feelings of admiration soon darken into suspicion and jealousy. Even from the beginning, you get the sense that this is going to lead to disaster. On the way back from the first battle after David slew Goliath, there is dancing in the streets and women singing, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Well, Saul has just been through 20 years of brutal war. Well, David has thrown a single stone. So perhaps we can forgive Saul for being a tad bit jealous. What Saul was concerned about, and rightly so, having spent all his years creating uh, at least a modicum of a kingdom of Israel with him as uh, a king, he's interested in passing that on to his son. And uh, he's a little bit concerned that David has picked up some allies at court, because uh, David turns out to be a good soldier. Saul is also suspicious of David's close friendship with Saul's son, Jonathan. The two young men form a brotherly bond on and off the battlefield. Saul now is becoming quite alarmed that David is positioning himself to be the heir of the throne, or failing that, to control Jonathan. And this becomes the basis uh, for the break with, with David. To escape Saul, David retreats to his home tribe of Judah, a region in southern Israel. But even here, he is hunted by Saul's hitmen. So David flees Israel and allies himself with its greatest enemy, the Philistines. It was at this time that David, be, David begins to assemble a cadre of what the Bible calls desperate men. They are really outlaws, they're soldiers of fortune, and they place themselves on the side of the Philistines. So now David is not only an outlaw, but in a very real sense, he's become a traitor to his own people. But before the Philistines accept David's help, they must be convinced he isn't a spy. First thing the Philistine prince is going to do, he's going to test David's loyalty. And how do you test an Israelite's loyalty? I've got to believe that he's going to order David to raid Israelite settlements. The Philistine prince controls the area called Goth, right next to the border of David's home tribe of Judah. Easy pickings against Israeli, Israelite villages. And so he sends David against the Israelite villages, and David follows orders. David becomes a raider of the border villages between Philistia and the Israelite kingdoms, and gathers up the booty and delivers it to, to uh, the Philistine prince. While David and his men are stationed near Hebron, the Bible says that the Philistine army makes a daring raid on the Israelites at Mount Gilboa. Saul and the Israelites hold the high ground. It looks as though they'll be able to hold off the Philistine attack. But the Philistines manage to encircle the Israelites and envelop them. Saul and Jonathan are doomed. Saul is hit several times. He turns to his sword bearer and says, do not leave me to the uncircumcised. They'll torture me and make sport of me. But the sword bearer can't bring himself to kill his king. Not willing to be captured, Saul takes his own life. The Philistines behead Saul and hang his body on a wall of a Philistine city. From the Philistine position, nothing could, could have been better. 
the Israelite monarch is gone. Uh, Israel is in defeat. The Philistines now control everything. But the Philistines have a problem. One heir to Saul's kingdom still remains, his son Ishbal. And neither he nor his chief military commander, Abner, is willing to accept defeat. Ishbal and Abner move across the Jordan River, but their government is too small and remote to be of major concern. So the Philistines simply ignore it. However, they do want a way to control the Israelite population. Their answer? Make David king. A messenger tells David of Saul's demise. He carries with him Saul's crown. The last people to have Saul's headpiece and his head, quite frankly, were the Philistines. Now suddenly it ends up in the hands of David. Makes one think that the Philistines have plans for David. With the backing of the Philistines, David becomes king of the tribe of Judah. But David's ambition is greater than that. He's not interested in merely ruling as a Philistine puppet. He wants to be king of all Israel. He brings in muscle from his days as an outlaw, men who were ruthless, experienced killers, and completely loyal to David. Well, he takes those, the, what's called the Gegud, which are those 600 uh, outlaws that he had fought with, uh, and he establishes them in all the villages and towns of Judah. And the reason for this is not only to extend his political control, but when he has to raise a militia force from, the, from those Israelite territories, these men can enforce his will. David chooses his nephew Yoab as his chief military commander to lead a civil war against Ishbal's growing army. David knows that to become the uncontested king of Israel, he must completely wipe out Saul's bloodline. The Israelites believe that Saul was anointed by God, so any blood relative of Saul is automatically more legitimate than David can ever be. That is, as long as they're alive. Over the next two years, David's forces, led by Yoab, clash with Ishbal's troops. With every slash of his blade, David moves closer to his ultimate goal, the crown of Israel. Superior technology puts you in control, both on the battlefield and at home. With DirecTV, you can easily set your home DVR from any cell phone or computer. It's around 1004 BC, just 10 years after David slays Goliath, he fights a bloody civil war to become king of all Israel. David's nephew, Yoav, leads the army against Ishbah, the son of the dead Israelite king Saul. The Bible is silent about the number of battles and how many people were killed, but it's very clear about the fact that Ishbal's army was getting the worst of it. The weapon of the day is the straight sword, used to hack, slash, and thrust deadly iron into the enemy. The six-foot wooden spear, now tipped with iron, is used to skewer opposing soldiers. Ultimately, David's men prevail, but there are some loose ends to tie up. And this is where David the Mafia Don really starts to show his colors. Like a scene right out of The Godfather, David becomes king and whacks all of his enemies. One of the first to die is Abner, Ishbal's commander. He had tried to defect to David's side, but Yoav considered him a threat. Yoav is the consigliere. Yoav is the trigger man. And he did it because it was the right thing to do, at least if you're talking uh, strategic politics. Then one night while he sleeps, Ishbal is assassinated. When the assassins present David with Ishbal's head, the king of Israel puts them to death. Now, looked at from a kind of Sicilian perspective. If one orders the assassination of another person, the best way to prove you weren't involved is to kill the assassins you sent to kill him. And he killed them as soon as they walked in the door. 
David makes this whole to do about how uh, horrible it was that Ishbal was killed. But of course, who is the one that benefited most from Ishbal's death? David. The Bible never blames David for his death. But logically, who else could have done it? In one final grisly act designed to secure his position as the king of Israel, David orders the execution of the last remaining blood heirs to the throne, Saul's seven young grandsons. David has them crucified and staked out into the sun where they all die. Uh, with that act, uh, there are no more legitimate claims to the, claimants to the throne. David will never be blamed for any of the murders. David's grip on the throne of Israel is secure, but his ambitions have grown. He wants to expand Israel into an empire. David rises to power because he's really the toughest guy on the block. He's the most ambitious guy on the block. He's the man with almost no limits in what he'll do to further his, his, his own interest. Uh, and so it's a, it's a, it's a bloody rise uh, to power. And then what happens is it becomes a bloody regime to stay in power. David's first order of business is to rid himself of any obligation. He betrays the Philistines who helped put him in power. In a series of bloody battles, he beats them into submission. After this defeat, the Philistine soldiers will fight for David's army. They'll supply him with their most prized weapon, the war chariot. The Philistine chariot of the day is drawn by two horses and usually carries two men, the driver and the archer. The archer must be highly skilled to launch precision shots while traveling on uneven surfaces at up to 10 miles an hour. The wooden platform is fashioned in the shape of a D with the axle placed in the middle of the carrying platform, ensuring stability and giving the chariot added strength. With an army that now numbers some eight to 10,000 soldiers, David captures the city of Jerusalem, where he establishes Israel's first capital. He looks around, and what does he see? What do any king see when they're in charge? Threats. And he looks to the east, and there on its border, on what today we would call the modern Jordanian River or Jordan Valley, there are three states that offer strategic and economic threats. Amman, Moab, and Edom, which is first on David's hit list. The real reason he wants that is, is economic. There are large copper and iron mines in, in Edom, and Edom sits right across what we call the King's Highway. The King's Highway connects Syria and Egypt. David wants free access to this important trade route, so he moves to take Edom by force. David moves very quickly to bring Edom within the Israelite orb, and does so with incredible brutality. David orders the complete extermination of the, Isra of the Edomite male population. Children and women are sold into slavery. Their government is dismantled. And Edom is essentially ceases to exist and is annexed by Israel. The brutal carnage at Edom is a potent message to any who might consider retaliation. But David's bloodletting has only just begun. Next on his hit list is Moab. Having achieved the conquest of Edom, destroyed its population, but gathered all its economic resources, and now having cut the king's highway, uh, the state that boarded up against Edom, the state of Moab, now appears to be a threat 
to containing those, to, to, to preserving those resources. It's an old story in history where something that was a buffer state at one point suddenly becomes a threat and has to be neutralized. It's kind of a, the, history's first domino theory. David knows Moab is not really a military threat to Israel because it's on the far side of the Dead Sea. But he doesn't want to take any chances. And again, he proves to be merciless. David sends his army against Moab and makes very quick work of him. Sheer numbers would have carried the day, but here we find an interesting description of how he actually dealt with them. And he smote Moab and measured them with the line, making them to lie down on the ground. And what the Bible tells us is that the captives of all military age were laid out in three lines. While the troops went among two of the lines, and put them all to the mouth of the sword, which means essentially uh, beheading them. For the second time, David massacres his neighbors, leaving them unable to rise against him. But David's about to collide with Israel's most powerful competitor in the region. More blood is about to spill on the Holy Land. It's around 1000 BC, and King David's Israelite army is on the warpath. They've already destroyed both the Edomite and Moabite people. Now, David leads nearly 10,000 troops north. Having conquered both Edom and Moab, David naturally turns his eyes uh, to the remaining uh, state that is a competitor for Israeli interests in uh, the Jordan Valley, and that is the Ammonites, whose capital is at Rabbah, which is modern uh, Amman. Amman is the last but most important of the three eastern border states David seeks to conquer. It is Israel's prime competitor for regional influence. In order to understand what happened at Rabbah, I have to understand the political context, and that is that the Ammonites were not stupid. They could clearly see the expansion of Israelite interests in into the valley. There were some negotiations between David and Hamon, the king of Ammon, until David claimed some kind of diplomatic insult. Uh, at which point, the Ammonites got the message and began to look around for allies. They found their allies in the north, the land of Aram, in what is called Syria today. It's a new force that has come to power under a leader named Hadadezer, who has ambitions of his own. Hadadez is no fool. He's looking for any pretext to extend his main influence south into Israel and to stop David's advance. This is just the perfect pretext. When David gets word the Ammonites have reached out to Hadadezer for help, he orders Joab to lead his army to Rabbah. And very quickly, he assembles uh, the entire army and puts uh, his consigliere, Joab, uh, in charge and tells him quickly to march on the capital of Rabbah and destroy it and defeat the Ammonites. Joab and the Israelites cross the Jordan River without opposition. With no other troops in sight, Joab marches straight across the plain to Rabbah. What happens is, is the Ammonite army comes out of its city and deploys in front of the city with its infantry offering battle. Joab positions his army opposite the Ammonites. But as the Israelites march toward the walls of Rabbah, 20,000 Aramaeans attack them from the rear. What had happened was the Ammonites formed up, essentially as bait to a trap. Joab and the Israelite army are now caught between a hammer and an anvil. To counter the Aramean attack, Joab does something completely surprising. He divides his force in two. So Joab turns to his brother, who's a second in command, and says, you take one group and attack the walls. I'll take the other and deal with the chariot. Remember that David had at his disposal a number of vassals of Canaanite and Philistine states whose specialty was heavy infantry and chariot warfare. Joab orders his Canaanite and Philistine chariot corps to turn around and charge the Aramaeans approaching from the plain. What follows is a swirling mass of chariots vying for position. 
as the opposing infantries fight it out in bloody hand-to-hand -hand combat. So, so this large chariot battle is fought uh, on the open plain in which the Arameans get the worst of and begin to flee. With the chariots on the run, Yoav turns his infantry loose. The Ammonite infantry, now mixing it up with the Israelite uh, infantry in front, of the, in front of the city, lose their spirit, and they begin to withdraw back into the city. And so, uh, the battle is essentially a draw. Yoav's success with his divided forces remains an amazing military feat to this day. Modern military tacticians always teach commanders to keep their forces together. But it sure must have uh, put the fear of the Lord in, in Yoav because he made no further movement uh, to attacking uh, the capital of Rabbah. He immediately grabbed the infantry, grabbed what chariots he had, and basically withdrew quickly back across the Jordan and uh, back, back to Jerusalem saying that uh, this has not been a great day. After the battle, the Aramaeans retreat north into what is now southern Syria. David wastes no time. The Bible states that he orders all Israel to assemble. And when you hear that phrase, all Israel, what you mean is the entire militia army, uh, probably 20 to 25,000 strong. David personally leads the Israelites north, bypassing the capital of Rabbah and the Ammonite army. He's a smart tactician, a little bit smarter than Yoav. Uh, he does not cross the Jordan Valley where Yoav crossed. What he does instead is he moves on the Israelite side along the watercourse of the Jordan Valley, using it to protect his flank. David and the Israelites collide with the Aramaeans somewhere south of Succoth. It is known as the Battle of Helam. What we have to imagine in the battle at Helam was that it was a combined infantry and chariot battle. David refuses to lose. King David of the Israelites is being true to his brutal reputation. His current victims are the Aramaean, and they are getting slaughtered. There's no great detail in the Bible except to say that a swirling battle was fought, and many of the Aramaeans were killed. The proof of this is that the commander of the Aramaeans was killed. Now that tends to suggest that they were completely overwhelmed. When you kill the commander of an ancient army, uh, whose chariot born, by the way, which means I can actually get out of here very quickly if I have to, you've done a very good day's work. Bruised by the Israelites a second time, the Aramaeans again retreat north. David now understands that I didn't come this far to win a single battle. We might as well deal with it while we have the troops in the field. And he continues to move north. News of the Aramean defeat at Halam spreads quickly throughout the region. Revolts erupt throughout the states that the Aramean king Hadadezer had already conquered. This creates a real problem for the Armenian king Hadadezer because he can't launch a concerted attack against David until he puts down these revolts. So he has to deal with both at once. Hadadezer orders one force to hold off David and the Israelites, while he mounts a campaign to put down the local revolts. At this point, David continues his advance north uh, and slams right into Hadadezer's rear guard. 
For the third time in six months, the Israelites battle the powerful Arameans. What happens is that uh, David catches up with Hadadazer's main army. He turns and a great battle occurs in which many thousands were slain, the Bible says. And David smote Hadadezer, king of Zobah, by Hamath, as he went to establish his dominion at the river Euphrates. David and the Israelites catch the Arameans on the run and slaughter many of them. Hadadezer's empire is destroyed. Now, unopposed from the north, David claims the Aramean vassal states in the name of Israel. So now, with the addition of the Aramean kingdom, David controls a very large area. This is what comes to define what is called the Empire of Israel. The new Israelite empire now stretches from the Euphrates River in the north to the Egyptian border in Sinai to the south, from the Mediterranean Sea in the west to the Jordanian mountains in the east. But one last foe remains to be conquered before David can rest, the Ammonites at Rabbah. Now, of course, they are deprived of their Aramean armies. And so David turns his attention to bringing Ammon into the Israelite orbit. But at the same time, the Bible says David is distracted from his military conquest by a beautiful woman he spies from his palace. This seems to be the time when David is smitten by this beautiful girl named Bathsheba. And so instead of taking the army himself into battle, some analysts suspect what kept David in Jerusalem was his lust for Bathsheba. Instead, he turns to his consigliere, Yoav, and says, take the army and go among the Ammonites and defeat them. David orders Bathsheba to be brought to him. But she is a married woman. Her husband, Uriah the Hittite, is a soldier under Yoav in the Israelite army. Total scandal. David is the stuff of legend. He's thought of as a great warrior and a great unifier. He's the founder of the first Israelite nation state, the darling of the Bible. But much has been said of his flaws, especially with women. And so, while David is having his way with Bathsheba, Yoav assembles the Israelite armies in two bodies. One is the militia force stationed at Sukkoth in the Jordan River Valley. The other is the elite army made up mostly of professional infantry and chariotry. They march to Rabbah and bring it under siege. When you talk about a siege, uh, and, and time, and this time, among the Israelites, is they have no siege equipment. They take cities the way they normally take cities, which is by storm. The problem with that, with regard to Rabbah, is in order to do that, you need a large numerical advantage. And most of the militia troops are at Sukkot. From on top of the walls of Rabbah, Ammonite archers are easily able to pick off the Israelite infantry. The blood spilled at Rabbah, however, is not what's occupying David's mind. David is back in Jerusalem, apparently, uh, having a good time with Bathsheba, and he gets a message from, from Yoav, his commander. He said, things are pretty tough here. He said, you know, every time we venture near the walls, uh, we lose men. We, we lost 18, 18 men uh, uh, just yesterday, in which case David replies, well, then don't go near the walls. Well, here is when the problem begins to develop, is that apparently Bathsheba turns out pregnant. And the problem with this is that she is married to Uriah the Hittite. 
So this creates a bit of a problem. Uriah is stationed with the army at Rabah, fighting for David. David calls Uriah back to Jerusalem. So Uriah, being the good soldier that he is, reports back to Jerusalem. And David says to him, look, you've been a good soldier. You're on the front line. You deserve a rest. Right, go back to your wife. Go rest a little before you go back to battle. Think about this for a minute. There's only one reason David would send Uriah home to Bathsheba, so they can have sex. It looks like David is trying to hide the paternity of Bathsheba's unborn child. Well, the next day, after David told him to go to, to uh, uh, his wife, uh, David walks out of his bedroom door and stumbles over Uriah the Hittite, who was falling asleep outside the door. And one can imagine what the conversation was like when the king of Israel says to this lowly soldier, what are you doing here? I told you to go home to eat and be with your wife. And he said, Sire, how can I do that? Uh, the, when my, my colleagues and, and, and fellow soldiers are in danger at the front lines, I cannot go with, with my wife. Uh, it, w- it, would, it would be wrong. Uriah keeps to the Israelite soldiers' code of honor. Uh, none shall sleep with their wives when at war. All for one, one for all, so to speak. But in refusing David's command to sleep with his wife, he seals his fate with David. The Bible says David writes a note for Doab and sends it back to the front lines with Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. A good soldier to the end, Uriah follows his commander's orders without question. Uriah the Hittite is a valiant soldier who fights for the Israelites. But the great King David has doomed him to die. David essentially, having failed to camouflage the the, the pregnancy of Bathsheba, simply decides uh, to to have her husband killed in an almost mafia-like style. Uh, And who else is in command of this, of course, is his consigliere, which is Yoav. Yoav orders Uriah into battle, where survival is impossible. David will stop at nothing to possess Bathsheba. In Jerusalem, Bathsheba hears that Uriah has been killed in action. She goes into mourning, standard cultural practice. As soon as her period of mourning is over, King David calls her to become his wife. But David's behavior doesn't go unnoticed. The Bible says it is God's will that the baby dies as punishment for David's sins. Uriah is dead. David has taken Bathsheba as his wife. This is all pretty heavy Old Testament scandal. But militarily, there's still a battle being waged at Rabbah. The Israelites are still stuck outside the walls of, of, uh, of Rabbah. And so finally, he sends, uh, David sends a message to Yohav, you know, renew the attack, carry, carry the day. Yoav finally breaks through the Ammonite defenses. And then Yoab, he sends a message back to David and says, in essence, look, uh, this is going well, but you better come out here because your, your, your absence is noted. And what people are going to say is going to give me credit for this victory. Well, David's no fool. Uh, he understands that to be king means that you have to do kingly things. And so what he does is he uh, marches 
up to Sukkoth, joins with the rest of the army, and then marches on Rabbah, and then now with even more troops, uh, the city is taken by storm. <laughs> As with all his previous triumphs, David makes a point of eliminating any chance of the vanquished rising up against him. The slaughter continues. The Bible says he set the people to the mold, which is essentially what the Pharaoh had done to the Israelites. He set them to construction work. One of their first tasks, tear their own walls down. Which is a very common thing to do in those days. Once you took the city, you destroyed its defenses so it couldn't resist you anymore. David's goals are complete. The Israelite empire is born. So it's a bloody rise to power. And then what happens is it becomes a bloody regime to stay in power. It becomes so bad that there are even revolts against David by his own people. Even by his own son. Talk about a dysfunctional family. David is still married to Bathsheba, right? The first baby dies. Well, David's got other wives and concubines and eventually has many more children, one of whom is Absalom. Well, it turns out Absalom will kill his older brother because the older brother rapes their half-sister. All right, now. This will start a rift between David and Absalom. The rift evolves into a full-fledged rebellion. Two Israelite armies clash in what is known as the Battle in the Wood of Ephraim. Absalom wants to overthrow David and become king. But in the end, Absalom's army is routed. The story goes that Absalom had this beautiful long hair. And during the battle, he gets it caught on the branches of a tree in the wood of Ephraim. Now, exactly what happened, we don't know. But one thing is certain, he doesn't make it out of that forest alive. David has issued orders to spare Absalom's life. But one man disobeys, Yoav. True conciliary, if that's what we could call him, Yoab eliminates David's biggest threat. Politically, he did the right thing. David rules the Israelite empire for 23 more years. The Bible states he dies peacefully in his bed at the age of 110. But even after his death, the murder and intrigue continues. David's other son with Bathsheba, Solomon, becomes the next king. One of his first acts, murder Yoav. This wasn't done for any kind of retribution. It most likely was to secure his own personal power. Solomon might have seen Yoav as a threat. And like his father before him, he eliminated that threat. David is the most popular figure in the Bible. Uh, children are named after him. He's seen as a hero, as the, fo uh, as the person who founded uh, uh, the Israelite empire, the, uh, the, the nation state. Uh, so he's, he is a kind of uh, almost mythical figure. But when you look at him in, in, in reality, he turns out to be all too human. From my perspective, even more fascinating that people still hold him up as a kind of uh, mythical person to emulate because he had a lot of bad habits. David is revered throughout the ages for uniting the tribes of Israel and establishing the Israelite empire. Like many conquerors, he was also ambitious, treacherous, and without pity. The Bible says that toward the end of his life, he was always cold, no longer able to feel warmth. Perhaps, like his amazing accomplishments, that too was a gift from God.